Uh, there are two lines in one of Longfellow's poems which have a very classical ring about them. He, he paraphrases and rephrases a very early statement. It goes back to classical times. Longfellow writes, The mills of God grind slowly, but they grind exceeding small. This thought seems to open a way to a rather practical insight into the patterns of life under which we live. I think everyone will agree that present conditions are not happy. They are not pleasant. But they are undoubtedly the inevitable results of the operation of the law of cause and effect. We have caused certain situations to arise in human society. And we must inevitably pay for the mistakes that we have made. Many persons of unphilosophical minds take the point of view that all these happenings are accidents. That they are beyond human control. They arise from circumstances which we do not understand and we cannot uh, overcome. This type of thinking brings with it gradually a certain fatalism and comes into violent conflict with the idealism that has always been present in human nature. We want to believe in good, but we look around us and we do not see evidence, at least immediate evidence, of goodness. We see all kinds of intemperances, we recognize the tremendous crisis that we face today in international affairs, and we like to think that we are the innocent victims of an outrageous providence. Some try to solve it all by simply denying that there is any providential factor. They like to think that man can do as he pleases and that whatever he does is right because he does it. And mistakes do not really exist if enough people believe them to be correct. All this thinking has a dismal effect upon the private lives of people. We are all concerned with conditions around us, and these conditions appear to be worsening every day and a certain hopelessness or helplessness sets in upon us. We begin to lose faith in deity. We begin to question the universality of laws. We remember a statement made not too long ago that it has required six million laws to attempt to enforce the Ten Commandments. We are in a problem. We know it. We recognize it but we are unable to cope with it inside of our own natures. Human beings are transitory as far as this world is concerned. We are here for a time, and then we depart, leaving behind us the chaos that burdened us during our lifetimes. All of these doubtful factors, these dismal prospects, the anxieties over ecology and pollution, our fear that nuclear plants are going to leak poisons into the air, the difficulties in the Near East, the curtailment of our petroleum supply, these seem to be piling up accidents. They seem to represent a confusion that is basic. But actually, the confusion is not basic at all. There is nothing in natural law that says that these problems must exist. They exist not because of natural law primarily, but because of the violation of it. The individual has not yet learned to obey the plan of which he is a part. He regards himself as a person standing alone in the midst of confusion. 
He regards other people much as he regards himself. They are persons. They are doing things we do not like. They are doing things to hurt us. And as a result of that, we get tied up in short-range thinking, in which it seems to us that if we were running this universal show, we would run it differently. People have had that thought uh, from the beginning. But if man had run it differently, we would not be in this dilemma. Now, it's obvious that the average person is not going to be able to make a universal reformation of mankind. And out of the problem, there comes a realization that integrity is a highly personal thing, but that this integrity, when distributed throughout civilization, would solve the problems that confront us. We have allowed in the last 50 years our moral and ethical codes to be deeply corrupted. And most of all, we have trusted our destiny upon one very fallible factor, and that is wealth. We are ambitious to have, and in the process of having, we have allowed ourselves to compromise practically every ethical standard with which we have been endowed. We have neglected to listen to the voice of conscience. We have failed to learn from the wisdom of the ages. We have failed the spiritual dedications that could have protected us. And now we find ourselves between the upper and lower grindstones of the mill of the gods. And this is not a very pleasant position. Uh, in the Orient, for example, the attitude towards this whole situation is very different from what it is in the West. Some ways, perhaps, we have improved situations, but in the main, we have overlooked the essential reason for human life. We are here to labor and to learn. We are here to help each other and not to help ourselves off of each other. We are here to work together for a common good and not to sacrifice the common good for personal ambition. Yet every day as we watch the news releases and listen to the informed or misinformed or uninformed commentators, we come to the same essential conclusion. The primary purpose of civilization as we know it today is to maintain an ever higher lifestyle. Lifestyle to us means opulence. It means to have the things we want. It means to go on with reckless spending and to, in any way possible, accumulate what we can, even at the expense of others. Now, this is contrary to the law of heaven, as the Chinese called it. This is contrary to the plan which has its own purposes. And these purposes are all summed up in one great purpose the salvation of all that lives. We are supposed to be working toward a better world. We are supposed to be dedicated to the gradual perfection of our society. The term civilization means the condition of living in a state of civility with each other. Civilization is almost a synonym for cooperation. But we have changed this and made civilization a synonym for competition. Every move that is made in our modern political tangle is calculated in terms of personal advantage or economic advancement. We have pushed the problem of wealth just about as far as it can go. And we are not uh, properly uh, un uh, understanding the situation, if we assume that wealth per se is wrong. Wealth is something that is a heavy responsibility upon humanity. Our entire industrialized civilization depends upon wealth. The wise use of it, the proper distribution of it, and the moral control of it makes it a useful servant. 
But where we disregard these factors and make accumulation the primary end of existence, we are going to remain, as we are now, in a state of internal and environmental disorder and disaster. To begin with, we have to go and look at the individual. Because the individual has a peculiar, divinely given right to live well. He may not always live in an environment that is doing the best, but this does not exonerate him. And in many th affairs of living, we are always in a condition to advance the basic integrities of life. There's hardly a day go by when someone does not come to me with a sad story of how they have been cheated, defrauded, abused, misused, scandalized by those closest to them. We find constant problems in the home between parents and children in which we see the gradual decline of our ethical control of ourselves. We know that our own lives could be made better and that a person living well in an environment that is tragically difficult has a peculiar reward for his own endeavor because after all he is here for a time he must leave what he has behind him but he must take what he is with him the great trouble today is that he is not sure what he can take with him he does not feel very comfortable about his own conduct he would hate to be interviewed on the gates of the other life and have a full story of his own conduct brought to his attention. He hopes, materialists particularly hope, that this dreaded circumstance will never arise because when he is dead, he is dead and that is the end of it. Now this oblivion at the end of life is a consolation for the corrupt. It is a means in which the individual sincerely believes that he can escape forever from the consequences of his own actions. He will depart, as his ancestors departed, and as his descendants will depart. And in each case, he will leave forever the troubles he caused. He will leave the mistakes which he permitted to endure to become part of the heritage of his descendants. The individual, therefore, in many instances, is seriously of the mind that if there is no life after death, he probably is better off. He would hope that oblivion will end it all, and that those who come after him will also pass into oblivion, as those who came before him passed into oblivion. Now, there is really no scientific proof of this point of view. There is no clear evidence that the individual leaving this life does not in some way face the consequences of his own conduct. We are no longer particularly interested in the idea that a few uh, virtuous persons, whose virtues in turn may be questioned, will go to heaven, and that for the rest, purgatory waits. This type of thinking uh, was fashionable at one time, and also was a moral deterrent to corruption. The individual did not relish the concept of suffering forever for the sins he committed today. Uh, philosophy has begun to analyze that situation and comes to the very simple conclusion that the universal power that fashioned all things did not intend that a great part of his creation should go to perdition forever. It was not part of the purpose that they should be lost souls. There was no reason to assume that the individual, part of a growing and unfolding life, should be thwarted, blocked, and forever condemned for the ignorance of a particular generation. The Oriental mind, working with this problem, came to the simple conclusion that whether we are in this world or some other place, we are there to grow and not simply to suffer. Very often we associate suffering with growth. We take it for granted that the individual, if he's going to try to live well, must live miserably. 
He must deprive himself of everything that the sinner and the backslider enjoys. He must live according to rules so strict and so stringent that most of the joys that we think of today, which are largely extravagances, are curtailed so far as he is concerned. He must live a lonely life of virtue in the midst of a happy and cheerful corruption. This situation, of course, is not exactly an appetizing interpretation of life. And there is really no truth in it, but we try to believe that there is. The human being, in adjusting to the times in which he lives, has many rewards as well as curtailments. The well-lived life, the consciously dedicated life, has many, many uh, appreciations and rewards. The first and most intimate, perhaps, of these situations is related to his own flesh. The world in which we live today is very hard on the human body. The body was not intended to be abused. It was given to us as a wonderful instrument for self-improvement, understanding, cooperation, and mutual friendship. The body is a structure ruled by laws. It was generated according to law. It exists in this world in a functioning companionship with law. And when the body has finished its purpose, it returns to the natural resources from which all bodies come. But this body cannot stand constant abuse. It cannot sustain itself in a life that is dedicated to law-breaking. And this is one of the situations uh, that we face today when probably more than ever before we find the encroachment of chronic ailments, we find the gradual decrease in efficiency, we find premature aging, and also innumerable heart attacks, nervous breakdowns, and mental uh, disjointings of one kind or another. So the body is taking the brunt of our own mistakes, and it is arguing back. It simply tells us we cannot do it this way. So in order to keep on doing what we please, uh, we try to, one way or another, medicate the body. If it is crying in pain, we give it a painkiller. If it's worn out, we give it a stimulant. If the mind becomes too heavy a burden upon the flesh, we can practically block out thinking with drugs. And a great many of our young people are becoming drug addicts to block out life, a life which they do not approve of, a way of life which they cannot adjust to, and responsibilities which are falsely placed upon them by circumstances over which they apparently have no control. So the body takes the first punishment. And it does not make any difference whether it is the body of the individual or a body corporate, a corporation, a nation, an institution. All of these are bodies to be used for the purposes of the advancement of human good. When they no longer serve this purpose, uh, they begin to disintegrate. What is not useful does not endure. And use is not the fulfillment of personal appetite, but the advancement of character. So we have this little poem about the mills of the gods, in which there is added to our problem a vast dimension of integrity, and there's nothing that we are more concerned over at the moment than integrity. If we cannot find it in ourselves, if we cannot find it in our world as we know it, then we are definitely blocked in our natural optimism and our natural desire for self-improvement. If, however, we begin to recognize these difficulties, not as punishments primarily, but as lessons, 
we can begin to learn something that may be of permanent value to us as we go through life. Nearly every pain we suffer from is a lesson. The pain itself is important. They tell the story about the man who, after a long series of experiments, was able to destroy the pain symptom in himself. He no longer felt pain. It went along all right to one day, not feeling pain, he sat on a stove, and that was the end of him. Pain saves. Pain protects. Pain guards us, guides us, warns us. But it is never regarded as a pleasant friend. It is always an adversary, interfering with the things that we want to do. In the world around us, we also come face to face with a situation that has been building up for thousands of years. We have inherited the disaster of the ages. We have inherited the mistakes that human beings have made from the beginning. We have inherited the wars of Alexander and of Caesar. We have inherited the invasions of the Mongol conquerors. We have inherited the wars and the hostilities of Napoleon, of Hitler, and of all the great ambitious men who have sought to fulfill their life destiny by destroying their fellow man. These inheritances have given us what the Oriental would call a heavy world karma. They have shown that the average individual will not, under normal conditions, change his ways. Man has developed a faculty that no other creature that we know possesses, and that is what Aquinas called a limited determinism. The individual can make certain choices of his own. He lives in a world of law, but he can interpret these laws according to his own needs. He lives in a universal a universe of truth, but he can understand the degrees of this truth according to his own intents. He has a right to say yes and no. He has a right to be for something or against it. He has a right to investigate, to study, to decide out of his own experience that which is good. The individual today, however, uses this power of choice to choose to do what he pleases. He uses it as a means of deciding against the very rules which he should obey. He attempts to escape the consequences of action, but does not uh, correct the causes of these consequences. Every generation is therefore faced with this tremendous burden of unfinished business. This burden, however, is a challenge. It is something that is here because we have put it here because we have done certain things that have brought about the consequences we dislike. Now, the facts of this are very evident and quite uh, easy to uh, discover. Those who are interested, for example, in certain phases of human culture can read with profit, given in his great, great book, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. It seems, if you read that book today, that it is a contemporary document. It shows exactly what happened to Rome. It shows exactly how it came to happen, and how the gradual deterioration of integrities and the constant expansion of personal ambitions finally resulted in the collapse of a great structure, a structure which had potential of a long endurance, but did not achieve it. We find the same in the histories of every nation. The mistakes we are making today are the mistakes that destroyed the past. The achievements of a constructive nature that we are making today are also present as bright sparks and bright lights in the long chronicle of history. Every good thing has played its part. Every new de dedication has resulted in a basic advancement of human nature and human purpose. But from the very beginning, we have persecuted most 
those who told us the truth. We do not want wisdom to interfere with pleasure. We are striving desperately to be happy by a means that will guarantee unhappiness. This is as natural as cause and effect and is a manifestation of it. We are much more privileged than the past because we can review what has gone before. We stand probably at the point of the greatest potential enlightenment, but we are not willing to learn the lesson. We consider that all history began in the present century, and all that went before was a mass of myth and legend and mistake. Actually, the myths and legends and mistakes are dominating us today. We have not learned. Families do not learn. They go through many unsettled years, which may end in divorce or other separations, but they haven't learned what keeps a home together. They have not learned how to rule and guide their own children. When they go to vote, they do not know who they are voting for, and the only policy that to the average person is meaningful is to vote for the candidate from which we as an individual are most likely to profit. If the candidate helps us to maintain our lifestyle, we vote for it, even though the lifestyle may be wrong. Today, lifestyle has blossomed as never before. And in the more advanced or more prosperous countries, the standards of living are very high, but the standard of life itself is very low. We are building constantly outward things which are in themselves perishable and corruptible and will inevitably fall. So now we get the idea, perhaps, that behind Longfellow's lines, namely that we are actually always and forever in the presence of an immutable truth, an inevitable procedure, and that the simplest, happiest, most, pl uh, most profitable and productive adjustment we can make is to adjust to this truth. Now, Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? And according to the Gospels, Jesus was silent. Truth is a very big word, and in its own in essence and substance is probably beyond definition. But there are certain evidences certain secondary tr truths which are very important in guiding us even though the primary may be obscure. The truth of a matter is the reality of it. The truth of a situation is its factuality. But most of all, it is its definite integrity. Truth is in incorruptible. Men can deny it, but they cannot disprove it. And truth is that we must cooperate or perish. There is no other possible answer, because we were made to cooperate. And whenever we do not cooperate, we place our complete psychic nature under stress. Gradually, as in the case of narcotics addiction, the false values which we have taken on have become habitual. Furthermore, they become habit-forming, and ultimately, they destroy the discrimination within ourselves, which might give us the strength to break these habits. So, little by little, we are losing our relationship to the world of which we are a part. We are losing our recognition that we are here to grow, to correct our mistakes, and to advance gradually toward the fuller appreciation of truth, to become a little more aware of the truth of the matter, whatever that truth may be. This uh, is a problem that today confronts us perhaps as never before. In the last century, industrialism and economic growth have become the great policies of life. We are constantly struggling with all kinds of complicated and difficult situations due to the interaction of these various factors, all of which have been allowed to get out of hand. 
So, instead of feeling that the world is in deep trouble, or that man's place in destiny is threatened, I think we should begin to realize that we are in a corrective period in civilization. It becomes obvious that if things continue as they are, we are going to be confronted by nothing but crises from now on for the unpredictable future. Everything that is difficult today is well on the way to being compounded. We are going to be faced with greater populations dwindling utilities, corruption of air and water, and the development of nuclear weapons which are distinctly and definitely unrealistic. These problems must be in some way solved. But before we can solve them really, we have to believe that there is a solution. Many people today doubt that a solution is possible. They doubt that the world can make these adjustments in, an, in a moderate length of time. This may well be true. And there's one thing we have to constantly remember, that we are in this world, but we are not of it. This world actually cannot control the thing that is inside of ourselves. No material force or power can corrupt man's spiritual heritage. There is no possible way in which the human soul can be damaged by externals. It can only damage itself by accepting, by recognizing and acknowledging things that are not true. So the mills of the gods are gradually grinding out the great problems of mankind. Probably the greatest problem with which we are confronted is ambition. And there is no one that can really write a good defense of it. Ambition is, of course, a pressure within us to excel in something, uh, to become a greater expert in our own field of living or thinking. In large terms, ambition is the impulse to get ahead, uh, to do things, to improve one's material estate, Ambition has caused all the miseries the world has ever known. Because in a world in which there are limited resources, there is no place for the aggrandizement of the individual. Now, the opposite of ambition is not inertia. Many people think that if their ambitions weaken, they are dying while yet they live. This is not essentially true. Ambition exists and can be used. But ambition should be devoted and dedicated to the definite labor of improving all things. Ambition should be the eternal hope of the individual that the world collective will find peace, happiness, and security. We should be ambitious for principles, but not ambitious primarily for profit. If we uh, do all that we can to fulfill the impulse within ourselves to make life better for those around us. We have probably the highest ambition that we can know. Another tremendous pressure in within us that is getting us into constant difficulty is selfishness. Selfishness is the mysterious attitude within ourselves that tells us that we should benefit most from anything that happens. Selfishness is self-centeredness, but in truth it is not self-centeredness, because the real self is not centered in that way at all. The real self, with a capital S, is universal. There is one self, from which all other selves are dependencies. They are fragments in the great mosaic of one eternal principle of, of life and integrity. Therefore, selfishness, really, as interpreted in the old philosophies, is man's selfish hope that all will be well with all. Selfishness is the ability of the individual, in the higher sense of the term, to be as thoughtful and considerate of others 
as he expects them to be of him. Selfishness may be fulfilled by living better than we have ever lived before. And in living better, we may be apparently focusing upon ourselves. But this is not wrong if, having attained to better, we use it to serve the common good. All selfishness should be a, an urge or an impulse to improve in order to be more useful. But selfishness which seeks to attain a superiority for the individual over those around him is contrary to natural law. Another common denominator of our negatives is fear. The individual is in a worried state. He fears the world in which he lives. And he most fears his fellow man because he cannot read the thoughts that dominate those around him. He is quite aware that he may be constantly the victim of a conspiracy. Fear has been tremendously exaggerated in recent years by a variety of literary productions and through the media. The media constantly tells us of the terrible things that are happening. Now, all these terrible things may be really happening. We're not denying that. But the impact upon ourselves is fear. We read all kinds of books about secret organizations that are seeking to undermine our world. And we become terror-stricken. Fear is, ever, is definitely man's anxiety about the unknown. That which cannot be easily, easily explained. That which seems to be hidden behind something. Something that we cannot actually investigate, but upon which we can bestow all kinds of frightful proportions. This is fear. And many people are suffering from it today. The wise have never been afraid. And this is something that is very important for us to think of now. There is no need for anyone to be afraid of anything except his own mistakes. And these he can rationalize and understand if he wants to. The fear of the unknown it develops all these negative anxieties because the individual recognizes the unknown as he sees it or senses it today as a vast uncertainty, a chaos, a kaleidoscopic mass of conspiracies, and he does not know which way to turn. The ancients feared neither life nor death. They feared neither the enemy or the false friend. But having come to a full acknowledgement of the law, they realized that there is no place in the universe for fear. There is no place in the universe in its natural state where there is anything that should cause man unreasonable anxiety. The only possible, legitimate source of anxiety would be natural disasters over which man has no control. But even these have their place, and nat natural disasters follow intimately upon the corruptions of society. Fear, therefore, is simply um, a hypnotizing, demoralizing, negative force. And it doesn't make any difference uh, how we view it or how we measure it. The individual as an eternal creature living under an eternal plan guided by an eternal wisdom and protected by an eternal love has nothing to fear. He has only to be afraid of his own mistakes. He is afraid perhaps that the negative part of his own nature will dominate him. If it does, it is because the good part has never had a chance. If, however, he really wants to overcome fear, he can do so. Because all fear is based upon uncertainty. It is based upon misinterpretation, misunderstanding, and the bestowing upon the unknown of malevolent factors. Out of the remote past, man suffering from all kinds of disagreements and disputes and dislocations in society finally decided that there must be a devil somewhere. There must be an evil spirit that is doing these things. 
certainly God would not afflict us with plagues and pestilences, there must be an anti-God. There must be an enemy of God. And this enemy is continually conspiring to thwart the purposes of deity. Buddha, I think, had as good an answer to this as anybody, because he was also uh, confronted by the learned of his day uh, with a difficult problem to solve, like the problem of Caesar's penny. So when they asked Buddha about the place of evil in the plan of things, he said very simply, if God permits evil, he is not God. If he cannot prevent evil, he is not God. And they uh, had no answer for it. And this uh, point has been carried on down uh, to give a lot of thought to things. I think probably the, one of the nicest statements of it that I know is a pleasant little story in which two little boys leaving Sunday school got in, uh, involved in a conversation concerning the devil. Uh, one little boy said to the other, Do you believe in the devil? The other one said, No, of course not. It's like Santa Claus. It's your father. <laughs> um, we have plagued the world with devils since the beginning, and it's been very nice to be able to shift our mistakes on them. If, as is believed in the Middle Ages, there were demons under the front steps of your house, and they even came in and sat next to you in the pew in church, if this type of thing was real, then everybody could sit back and admit happily and cheerfully that it wasn't his own fault. Nothing that goes wrong is our own fault. We change that now. We don't have a devil to blame anymore. But we have politics, and we have economics, we have industry, uh, we have international relations. All these things now take the place of the devil in one way or another and make it possible for us to feel that we are not to blame for anything. It's all stacked against us. Well, no philosophy of this kind can ever pull us out of the doldrums. It simply gets us in deeper than we were before. Let's take a very simple look from a Greek standpoint on this situation. The Greeks were convinced, in their own way, uh, that there was one sovereign principle. That this sovereign principle can be called God, or it can be called life, or it can be called infinite mind, whatever you want to call it. It is one eternal principle, as Pythagoras pointed out. All division into multiplicity uh, takes pla take place within this unity. There is nothing outside of totality. Therefore, all that exists, exists within totality. It is a differentiation of one principle into an infinite diversity of manifestations. But as they all come from the one, and that one is good, all of these manifestations are by nature and substance good. The world in which we live is a mystery to people and to all of us, to a great degree. For some reason, which rests only in the divine consciousness, the individual is not born with a full apperception of the unity of life. He is not born with his mind already set in the direction in which it should go. The reason why we have not all been born perfect. There is a reason why virtue must be achieved. It is not thrust upon us. Virtue comes to the individual as a personal choice. The power that created man gave him the power to be right because it gave him the ability to decide, uh, to explore, to contemplate upon the phenomena of life. And it gave him the great textbooks which were necessary for his own salvation. Of these, in most nations, the greatest of these textbooks is the universe itself, which he can gradually probe and explore. 
The second next book is the sacred writings that have descended to all peoples from ancient times. These are very largely summations of moral and ethical principles, the laws of living. The third textbook is man's own body, in which in miniature all the processes of nature play out. That which is bad for the body of the individual is bad for his world. Man was placed here to gradually unfold his own consciousness, to gradually open himself to ever-increasing and improving levels of consciousness until finally he would be aware of and one with the one principle at the root of life. This was therefore a school, and it was a school in which millions and billions of little atoms which are in the body of God are growing up. This school has its rules, its laws, its principles. This school teaches certain necessary subjects. And the, the school of life is probably the most rejected but most necessary of all educational institutions. Uh, the individual is never frustrated in his ability to learn. It is his inclination to learn that is usually at fault. After we begin to think about this, we realize that the entire pattern, the entire program, has as its uh, real substance that it shall produce the enlightened person. And it shall produce it because that individual earns that enlightenment by his own conduct, by his own insights, by his own efforts. It is not bestowed. It is revealed and released through him by his own efforts, by his own indefatigable determination to find the answer to himself. Many ancient peoples gave much thought to this, and they realized that in some way uh, there must be a means or a method by means of which the individual could more rapidly uh, learn the lessons of life. So several different disciplines were bestowed upon man in ancient times. The first and basic of all these disciplines was purification. This was the great discipline of the ancient Greeks, that the individual, before he can become wise, must purify his life of those corruptions which make wisdom impossible. In other words, purification was not merely washing your hands, nor was it bathing in the sacred tank. Purification was the cleansing of the life it was the elevation of integrities. It was the proper use of emotional, mental, and physical potentials. Purification was the right to be right. It was the right to use every facility that has been given to us in the most constructive, idealistic manner. Purification was of the body, was accomplished in antiquity by dietetic uh, restrictions, by leaving off certain foods that were not useful, to break away from all things entering the body which are likely to corrupt the body. It was ventilation. It was exercise. It was the gradual putting of the body into the most perfect condition possible so that there were no naggings from the flesh, that the individual was not constantly beset by pressures which arise primarily in the body. This was the beginning of the life of wisdom, that the individual should build a house according to the law. And if he builds this house of his own flesh according to the law, the living God will dwell therein. Having gone through purifications, moral, ethical, physical, those seeking truth uh, then settled themselves upon a way of wisdom. What do you have to do to learn? How are you going to improve knowledge? The Greeks followed the same system as the Hindus, the Chinese, and practically all other nations. Uh, they placed the, the student seeking to know under the guidance of those better informed than himself. So there were schools of teaching. There were great scholars. There were philosophers. There were mystics. And there were the state mysteries and all of these institutions which existed to communicate to the individual more and more 
of the divine plan. Therefore, next after purification came a type of discipline. This was no longer merely disciplining the body, it was the disciplining of the emotions and of the mind. The individual who can't control his temper is not going to be able to experience the presence of God. He may think he is, but if it comes in this form, it must be questioned as being an hallucination. The individual who cannot control his thoughts cannot become truly wise. And where the will within the person uses both the mind and the emotion for the gratification of its own personal ambitions, then we truly have Samson bound to the millstone of the Philistines. We have something great, splendid, magnificent, immortal, tied down to the smallest, insignificant and inconsequential activities. So the mind has to be controlled so that it thinks straight. It, the emotions have to be controlled. So the feelings are noble, gentle, kind, compassionate. To gain this mental discipline, which was so required, uh, it was necessary also to convert or convince the mind. It had to be taught how to think. It had to be taught how to escape those opinionisms which Epictetus calls a falling sickness of the reason. It is the gradual cultivation of common sense. Mental discipline is grounded in common sense. It is the individual capable of the kind of straight thinking we find among primitive people. The straight kind of thinking uh, that does not necessarily uh, found itself in intellectualism, but in a, an intelligible advancement towards uh, wisdom. This type of thinking drew upon the wisdom of the ages and uh, gave the person the keys to organized mental activity. The Greeks liked to think that mathematics, astronomy, and music were the master sciences by which the mind could be disciplined. Mathematics gave the concept of exactness. Uh, astronomy gave the concept of vastness and inclusiveness. And music gave the concept of harmony or adjustment between living things. Those who were grounded in these were ready, perhaps, for higher advancement. But there was a catch in this, which we have uh, overlooked. Namely, that these ends, these sciences, are to be acquired for the enlargement of consciousness and not the enrichment of the purse. Uh, in Greece, there were a number of professional teachers who were called the sophists and they were held in poor repute, largely because they educated for a fee. They were like tutors, uh, and they were looked down upon as by that very circumstance alone that they'd made a fee, that in one way or another it was not a complete dedication to truth. Now, some will say, well, if you did that today, most of our educators would be in the poorhouse. That might be true, but it wasn't true then, because the ones who became the great leaders of Greek thought for over 300 years, producing over 200 of the world's most enlightened thinkers, did not make that type of charge. They were supported, they were helped, their disciples loved them, their disciples saw that they wanted nothing and needed nothing, but their wants were few and their needs were few. And the uh, relationship by, between the uh, disciple and the teacher uh, was practically free from all economic factors. So the career of the teacher must be primarily a dedication uh, to instructing those who need instruction and should not be based upon an increasing wage bracket almost to the point where our educational institutions uh, face strenuous reductions in overhead. Having earned a certain amount about discipline of the mind, having become fairly well versed in mathematics, and having a basic insight into astronomy as it was known to the ancients, the next thought, of course, was music. 
Now, music was aimed not at the mind, but at the heart. Music was harmony. Music was the joy of melody. Music was the magnificent expression of artistry through choral singing, through instrumentation, and through every device uh, that would be harmonically acceptable. Now, music had its rules also, and the ancients were very definite in pointing out the difference between music and noise. They were also very clear in their differentiation between the attainment of harmonic enlightenment and the danger of anharmonic discord. The Greeks were fully aware that the whole story of life could be summarized in the story of music. They knew beyond all doubt that wherever music is corrupted, society suffers. Wherever discords of sound are encouraged, internal integrity is threatened. Today we live in a world of noise. Most of it is anharmonic. Much of it is strident. And because of its effect upon our own inner lives, our musical theory itself has been corrupted. So that today, uh, inharmonic compositions, uh, the so-called pieces of music that have no actual inspirational value are becoming more and more frequent. Uh, these simply are means of stimulating emotional reaction without integrity. So music, corrupted, has given us many of our problems. Every area of knowledge, when corrupted, becomes dangerous. Every field of research, when abused, becomes a menace. Now, we should know these things, and we should have the courage to try to do something about it. But the trouble seems to remain, as it always has remained, that skills of all kinds are not related to religion. The scientist does not feel himself indebted to religion. He does not believe that it is necessary for science to be controlled by something stronger than the human mind. The sciences are not isolated mental phenomena. The scientist who is undevout is in constant danger of corrupting knowledge as he corrupts skill. There has been much advance in scientific knowledge in recent years, but much of it has been dangerous. Wherever a science exists by itself, for itself, of itself, it is dangerous. Wherever any branch of knowledge isolates its own peculiar content and enters perhaps into conflict with other sciences, or at least is in a more or less non-adjusted relationship, wherever this exists, the benefits of science are reduced and its dangers are increased. Probably the dangers of science have become greater and are now overwhelmingly menacing. We discover that a great part of science is, no, is not dominated by determination to serve other people. It is a determination to advance a kind of knowledge, a desperate determination to prove something, rather than to discover value as far as the public mind is concerned. Thus science today has more or less forfeited its birthright. It has not stayed true to its real purpose. Bacon in his Novum Organum Scientiorum, the new organ of science, tells us that the end of science is that man shall learn on a scientific level all that it is possible for man to know and that all he learns shall be dedicated unselfishly to the well-being of all that lives. Now, it's the second part that's missing. And because that secondary part is not there, we must assume that the level of idealism, even of the most educated, is not high enough to cause a dedication. It is not uh, strong enough to lift the individual out of his own selfishness into an integrity for the common good. The same is true of government. People's worked with government for a long, long time. One Greek said on an occasion, As fortunate is that governor for whom the people wish the best. 
for it is those who fear for him and not those who fear him that have achieved a leadership that is real. This type of thinking is very old, but it is basic. And there's something inside of all of us that recognizes basics when we give them proper attention. There is no doubt in the world that we are in a position uh, to appreciate value. But too much of the time, we have neither the opportunity nor the leisure to cultivate value. This is a very serious limitation in our way of thinking. So when it's all said and done, we live in a perfectly honest universe. The trouble is that we are not too honest ourselves. We live in a world that rewards virtue and punishes vice. Therefore, we have prison after prison loaded with those who haven't learned this. We, have a, we live in a world that wants us all to be happy. But we cannot all be happy while two-thirds of us haven't enough food. We are supposed to rejoice in the advancements of science. And as a result of these advancements, we sell weapons to one nation or another. We haven't learned the very basic facts of life. That either we work together, or what we call civilization will fade away. And if it fades away, it will probably be quite a time before it builds back again. We do not want to face a repetition of the Dark Ages. We want to gradually wake up to the fact that all exploitation is against a, a natural law, and nothing can be against law and survive. For a little time, the uh, dishonorable person seems to flourish like the green bay tree, but in the course of time he is cut down, because the mills of the gods grind exceeding small. No matter what we do, it has its consequences. And the thing we want to do now is those types of things that have good consequences. And we can start right in with ourselves and try to get a greater insight. Because when we go out of here, we go into a condition or dimension of existence in which what we really are is all important. What we have, what our worldly estates have been, how successful we have been in business or politics, even though we have been the rulers of nations and have received all kinds of awards for our skills, these things are of no consequence whatever. They are part of a delusion that man has built. The thing that counts when we go to where things do count is kindness most of all. And with that understanding, compassion, and dedication, and if we believe in the law of reincarnation, we want to also believe that we come back to be useful and not to be rich again. That we come back to serve those who need and not become involved in a selfish, competitive way of life. Actually, man's great cycle of rebirths is great enough to bring us all to perfection. If it was not, all would fail. But that power which sees each sparrow's fall is not unmindful of the struggle to which life passes and recognizes that this struggle is unnecessary. And so the prophets, they say, have come to tell us the truth. The sages and the saints and the seers have revealed to us the workings of the law. They are the highest authority we know. The highest because in our own hearts we realize that what they said was the thing most close to truth that we have ever heard. So these wisdoms are available to all of us. And uh, they can begin the quiet process of helping us to orient ourselves in our own life stream. We are flowing through time and eternity. We are like ships that pass in the night. We have all the contacts and relationships of existence, and for the most part we resent them. But if we did not resent them, if we understood them, we would find that this great pattern of life is far more beautiful, far more wonderful 
than we have ever expected it to be. If we go out into the hillsides and into the valleys and we see flowers growing at the roots of ancient trees, we see beauty everywhere. We see everywhere things fulfilling themselves. We see the marvelous growth of life. We see that each thing is constantly releasing life from within itself. Man, having a more advanced organism than these other things, uh, is not aware that the constant release of life through himself results in the ultimate beauty and the ultimate cooperation and the ultimate re-identification of living things with the life within them. Nature in its wonder has given us hundreds of different colors of flowers and the plumage of birds and the scales of fishes. It has given us tiny things so small that even the microscope can barely capture them and faced us with vastness so great the most powerful telescope cannot penetrate it. All this vast coordination is not in constant conflict. It, planets are not colliding every once in a while. The various forms of life are regulated by immutable procedures. And all these things are unfolding from within themselves according to law. And where man abuses this law, he ceases to unfold. He is no longer part of the plan. And it is very important for him to, to consider more deeply this plan and try to harmonize with it for his own good and his own security. We have also one other point to make in connection with this mill of the gods. And that is that most of all, it encourages us to obedience. The only answer is to who do we obey? Do we obey those who are the natural sophisticates who have led us into trouble since the beginning? Do we obey those who are seeking to exploit us? Do we obey those to whom obedience is given by fear alone? Do we obey because they have some mysterious hypnotic influence on us which we cannot resist because we do not understand it? To obey, finally, is to obey the universal plan. To stay in harmony with the will of heaven. To keep the rules which have been given to us and have been set forth in most of the great legal codes of the world. From the oldest time, there were great legal codes by which our conduct was directed. Way back in the time of Hammurabi in Babylonia, there was a rule, there were many rules, but there was one rule that had to do with a man who built a house. The rule had many interesting branches and implications in it, but the substance was this. If a man builds a house badly, and that house falls down, or does not fulfill its purpose properly. The owner, who is the sufferer, has the right to decide what shall happen to the culprit. If he says the culprit should be hanged, there's a possibility that he might be. But most likely, the owner would say, I want the house rebuilt and rebuilt correctly. And if the builder refused to do this, he was imprisoned. There was no further doubt. The, every transaction must be honorable. And that was the rule 3,000 years ago. That anyone caught adulterating a product, misrepresenting a statement, breaking a promise, this type of thing was punishable by law. Quickly, immediately, and without an elaborate defense uh, by some professional lawyers. Either it was done right, or the blame went where it belonged. As a result, we find the evidence that the buildings back in those days stayed together rather well, because it was necessary to have that kind of a rule. And it was also in this code all kinds of t teachings and moral statutes. That code, as it was written 3,000 years ago, was more honorable, more final, more brief and clear than any code we have composed in the last 500 years. 
the code was intended simply for the purpose of rewarding the righteous and making the unrighteous do it over again. This type of thinking uh, was very basic, and it was based upon a simple principle. This code, the code of Hammurabi, was not created by Hammurabi. It was created by God and revealed to the great king, probably to his counselors and those who served him. But the final authority, the final power, was rested in heaven. And anyone who broke the laws of men broke the laws of God. Uh, of course, there are laws that have come in now to protect the guilty. They weren't in the Code of Hammurabi. But uh, in, in substance, those laws which are right and proper originated in revelations like the Ten Commandments, revelations of sages and prophets. They were the foundation of civilization. And before them, all human beings had to live in a condition of humility. Only the eternal is self-governing. All else must be governed. Only that which is the eternal lawmaker is the master of the universe. And this lawmaker is eternally good and eternally wise and is the only power that we know that is fully aware of its own purposes. Under such conditions, it is said by Plato that in a republic or a democracy, the best must govern the rest. In the great universal plan of things, the best must govern the rest. And the best is the eternal principle of life itself manifesting through an immutable pageantry of laws. These laws are the will of the Creator. These laws are the substance of the good life and how man can live it and come in, t in time to the fullness of his own purpose. But before this power that alone knows, all are servants together all are in bondage to truth which is a happy state whereas bondage to error is the most miserable condition that is imaginable but bondage to truth is to be always termed in the form that the burden is light and the yoke is light truth in serving it we find not a hard taskmaster but something that becomes more and more adorable to us until in the service of truth or in the service of each other or in the service of the divine plan we come to peace, happiness, and security. All these principles are involved in the realization that the laws of nature work, that the laws of nature, as Aesop said, have as their principal vocation the raising up, of the, raising up of the lowly and the casting down of the great. Everywhere in nature there is a divine justice. And while generation after generation may pass and not be aware of this justice and believing that they can live in contrary to it will per per perpetuate their own selfish and self-centered policies. The final fact remains that there is no mistake that we ever made that we do not have to correct. There is no example of ignorance which not, must not be transmuted into wisdom. There is no hate that must not be transformed into love. Everything that is negative and dangerous to us arises from our own ignorance and is scattered abroad by the various means of communication that we have today. All that is not true shall be ground down. All that is true shall be lifted up. All that has to do uh, with the future of the world will be worked with, nature will step in, strategy and crime and suspicion and all these things will be washed out. They will be finally cleansed by the plan itself. But it may be a long road. It's not something that's going to happen in a moment. But how long it takes depends very largely upon man. 
Because on this planet, the problems that man suffers from are man-made, and the corrections must likewise be made by man. That which he has done, he must undo. Uh, that which he has falsely built up, he must recognize his mistakes and correct his attitudes. Policies that are not good for all are not good for anyone. And all the struggle for power, the struggle to conquer, all this is a delusion. For we are always, and have been always, fighting war after war for possession of this little molehill we call the earth. And when we get it, what do we have? Simply a graveyard. So nature is trying to tell us these things. Nature is trying to make it obvious to us uh, that nature will win. That no power that man can use can corrupt the law upon which existence stands. The individual who says he is breaking a law really telling us that the law is breaking him. Man can never break any laws except those he made himself. And even some of these perhaps should be broken. Others should not. But no man can break the divine law. No one can interfere with the immutable purposes of the infinite plan. These purposes will be fulfilled. And in the fulfillment of them will bring us all in due time uh, to a condition of actual security that cannot be destroyed by political motions the utopia we hope for can never be conquered or captured by an ambitious despotism. The thing that we are looking for is a world which will cease to realize or believe that in the conquest of others there is greatness. Greatness lies in the conquest of self. And this is something we all have to learn. And when we learn it, we will realize what the mills of the gods are doing. The mills of the gods are making this final achievement of integrities inevitable. It is, they are going to grind away the false values. They are going to grind, grind away that which is destructive. And they probably will grind swords into plowshares one of these days, we hope. But always the plan works. And it, a great faith in this is the greatest strength that man has today to com uh, that combat the pressures of the world in which he lives. If we are quiet and firm and true within ourselves, we are one with reality. And it is better to be w one with reality in a very simple way than to be the ruler of all the nations of the earth. Because no one can really be their ruler. The ruler was there before they came. The ruler has always been there and always will be there. But sometime we will have the wit to realize this and in so doing start the kind of world we all hope for. Well, time's up, folks, with this episode.